This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. Achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own Safety Pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. In this episode, I am going to revisit record keeping. I came across a great article recently from our friends at iReportSource.com. And I'll talk a little bit more about iReport Source. And we have a big announcement coming up regarding iReport Source as well. We'll do that outside of this episode on social media and record a whole separate podcast episode talking about that big announcement. But, you know, I, I met with uh, the folks at iReport Source. I met with the CEO, some of the folks that do business development for that company. Uh, incredible people, incredible company. And, you know, I, I stumbled across some of their articles that they had been posting. And I thought, you know, they've got some really good information and, and reached out. And, you know, I want to share one of these articles uh, with you, which is the point of this episode, which is quite simply five common OSHA record keeping errors you want to avoid. And I'll expand on each one of the five, but I'll run down each each of the five as they posted in their article. I'll have a link to the article on their blog page as well and share that with you. But, you know, whether it's the beginning of the year and you're starting fresh with a, a blank OSHA 300 log, or if it's mid-year, end of the year, wrapping up the year, doesn't matter. These are five common OSHA record keeping errors that you want to avoid. And we will get into how to do just that. Before we jump into today's topic, I want to tell you about the official floor marking, floor sign company of the Safety Pro podcast, Mighty Line Floor Tape. They know how important safety is to your organization, and the breadth of the Mighty Line product line covers everything you need to implement a 5S system for the increased productivity of your facility and the safety of your workers. Mighty Line Floor Signs are a great product to regulate workplace traffic. They are customizable to fit exactly what your company needs. You can even upload and use your own high-res logos and images. Now, what makes Mighty Line floor tape so mighty? We get people asking this a lot. Just listen to some of these facts. Their patented technology makes it more durable than other floor tapes because it is seven times thicker than the average floor tape. The beveled edge increases durability for forklift traffic, which, you know, is going to last a lot longer. And the peel and stick adhesive removes easily with very little residue left behind. There are videos showing this on their website, by the way. And of course, it's all made right here in the USA. Get a free sample. Try it for yourself. Stick it down on your floor. Run over it. Walk on it. Push carts over it. Do whatever you want to. See how it works for yourself. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, get a free sample, fill out the little form right there. They'll ship it right to you. You can even catch past episodes of the Safety Pro podcast right there on that page. Again, MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. So what are some of the top mistakes employers make when it comes to OSHA record keeping? And in this case, we're talking about injuries and illnesses. Now, even with good intentions, there are some of the top mistakes that could happen, uh, resulting in major headaches and even potential citations. One, not understanding what an OSHA recordable work restriction is. Two, not using enough detail on your records. Three, not using a system to track employees days away from work and other related events. Four, not keeping OSHA 300 logs up to date during the required five-year storage period, and five, lack of alignment between workers' comp record keeping and OSHA record keeping. I'm going to expand on each one of these. Okay, number one, not understanding what an OSHA recordable work restriction is. This is a very common mistake. Don't make the mistake of believing an injury is not recordable as a work restriction if your injured employee is still doing what we would call quote-unquote useful work. 
even if that work is within their job description. Just because you've worked at maybe another employer that made this mistake or you've done this in the past, you know, don't repeat this. Even if it's a misunderstanding of the regulation up until now, recognize how OSHA states how much it comes down to the routine functions of the worker's job, of what they do, the tasks, okay? Restricted work occurs when, as the result of a work-related injury or illness, you keep the employee from performing one or more of the routine functions of his or her job or from working the full work day that he or she would otherwise have been scheduled to work or a physician or other licensed healthcare professional recommends that the employee not perform one or more of the routine functions of his or her job or not work the full work day that he or she would otherwise have been scheduled to work. Keep in mind, none of this applies to the day of the injury. You start counting on the second day and beyond. So the day of the injury doesn't apply. The other thing you want to consider here is, we get this question a lot. What is a routine function? What does that mean? Well, according to OSHA, a routine function or duty or task is anything the employee would normally perform at least once per week. Let me repeat that. A routine function of his or her job is performing any task at least once per week. So if I go to the doctor for a work-related injury and the doctor says, Blaine, I don't want you to climb any stairs or ladders. And I go back to my employer and I say, I can't climb any stairs or ladders for a week or five days, seven days. It doesn't matter. Just I can't climb any stairs or ladders for a prescribed period of time. You want to look at my job description and say, how often does Blaine actually need to climb stairs and ladders related to his work? Well, we have one set of stairs all the way in the back receiving dock, but Blaine works in the front office. And there are no stairs or ladders. And he does primarily administrative work. That's not a work restriction according to OSHA. So you would not count days restricted in that specific example. So you want to be, you have to be able to prove this, by the way. It must be a defensible position. So you can't just say, oh, well, we'll just not have him do those two things this week because it involves climbing stairs or ladders. And and we'll just have him do it next week. And then, so technically he's not restricted because we can move his schedule around at will. Be careful because you're only changing my schedule around because of the injury. And so therefore it's a restriction, right? Does that make sense? If you're restricting it, even if it's self-imposed, if you're modifying my work as a, re as a result of an injury or illness, that also falls into the category of a work restriction. It doesn't always have to be a, a licensed healthcare provider. So look at your tasks, determine what it is that I have to do on a daily, weekly, you know, monthly, quarterly basis, so on and so forth. And that way, when something like this comes up, you're able, you have documented job descriptions and tasks to be able to refer to and, and say, hey, this isn't a restriction because we have a written documented job description or, okay, this falls within a work restriction. So just keep that in mind. So always have good written job descriptions with tasks and frequencies laid out for this reason. Number two, not using enough detail in records. I did an entire episode on effective accident reports, okay? Uh, be sure you accurately report and record all injuries each and every time, including first aids and near misses. They're all the same. Document, 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 okay? That means including as many specific details as possible in case you need to defend a certain incident or issue. For example, you may uh, include factors such as where the injury or incident happened, the incident and what the incident was and the, the event that took place, the source, events leading up to the incident and immediately after, equipment involved, uh, the state of that equipment, the exact nature of the injury or illness, things like that. Go back and listen to the, it was only a, a couple before this one. So uh, you shouldn't have 
too much trouble scrolling down to find that episode, an effective accident report. So check that one out. But with something like iReport Source, you have a guided process that was designed to help make sure all information is collected and recorded in an accurate and detailed way. No matter what worker is collecting that information for future use, it is, it's, anybody can use this. Anybody can use iReport Source and document this information. It doesn't have to be an EHS professional. It can be a supervisor, a worker, anybody in the organization. A major part of this is making sure that you have a way for all workers to record and or report work-related injuries, illnesses, and incidents. And again, I'm, I'm throwing in there near misses. If there's no simple and accessible way to do so, it's going to be that much harder to make sure that you know, information is consistently gathered in a detailed, comprehensive manner. Oh, gosh. Uh, again, several episodes ago, I talked about this, about using an automated system. And, you know, it, it gets really dicey when things are longhand, right? Paper, and you get conflicting uh, accounts from one person to the next. Uh, you've got, you know, everything from typos to not filling out certain information on the form and you didn't catch it, like date of hire, date of birth, things like that that are required on a uh, 301 form. And uh, you're using your own accident report. Look, going with a digital system, you know, it forces you to put in an answer. It won't let you continue or submit until you got, you know, some of the required info filled out. You know, technology can actually help us in this regard. And especially when you have remote workers, workers on different shifts in different buildings or in different geographically dispersed areas like remote job sites for construction or even in the service industry, technicians out at different client sites and they have to fill this stuff out. They have to get that paperwork back somehow, scan or use, use their phone to scan the paper. They lose the paper, spill coffee on. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff. Look, there are digital solutions available. iReport Source is one of them, and, and it makes it super easy for anybody to use. So that's the point here is not using enough detail in the records can, can be solved simply by having a workflow, a digital workflow that forces you to put something in there at least, right? And then you get an immediate email or notification if you're an administrator or a manager of this uh, information. And you can see right away, okay, they just put some gibberish in here to be able to hit the submit button. They don't really know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up right away and get the skinny on this. You're able to audit that process, sort of QC that process immediately instead of having to try to pour through paperwork later as it comes in. So just keep that in mind. Go check out that past episode about writing effective incident reports and uh, consider what I'm talking about here when you listen to that. Okay, number three, not using a system to track employees days away from work and other events. I mean, do you have detailed information on what's happening with all of your incidents or, or claims, right? And are you able to easily see the ongoing status of any injured worker, no matter how long they've been away from work? One of the biggest errors employers can make is forgetting to track the days away from work once an employee has stopped reporting to work. You also don't want to be in the dark when it comes to updates to an employee's health that come from their physician on follow-up visits. You want to be able to track when somebody's due for a follow-up visit and make sure that they actually go, okay? The, you know, managing this claim, and I'm, it's going to sound like I'm getting into a little bit of the workers' comp side, and, and you know what we are, but it's related. You want to get them back to work as, as soon as possible. First of all, adopting a policy of no lost time, we always provide light duty no matter what, is always a best practice. But staying on top of this claim as it unfolds, as it ages, you don't want it to get away from you, okay? So do you have a system to track all of these milestones, follow-up visits with reminders? It's really hard to do going from long-form paper and then having to grab your phone and put in calendar reminders and things like that. You know, it really requires you to do that manually. But a system, an automated system built for this is really where I'm pushing you, okay? I, you know, I've talked about it in episode after episode after episode about, you know, really leaning on technology and no matter what it is, you know, look for something that works for you. Okay. But to fix this potential issue that you have, 
make sure you have a system that can track and monitor these types of, you know, ongoing subsequent events. With that kind of visibility, you can consistently track these cases and you can put that knowledge to use too. So you can mitigate risks that have been, you know, causing those accidents in the first place. You're able to track over a period of time a number of incidents because you're putting them all in one place, one technological repository, if you will. And so whatever system you choose has to be able to produce some dashboards and trending, okay, like, like iReport Source does. So keep that in mind. Not using a system to track employees days away from work and, and other subsequent events is a mistake, a big mistake a lot of employers make. Number four, not keeping OSHA 300 logs up to date during the required five-year storage period. Again, if you're doing this long form with papers and files and folders and, you know, maybe you leave the company, maybe you've just come into the company and you don't know where some of this stuff is, you want to go back and see a history of injuries and illnesses in the organization. Look, we've all been there, right? And, and people just shrug and go, I, I don't know, the last gal, you know, or a guy handled that. And, I, and, you know, this is the file cabinet they used. So if it's in there, that's where it would be. And, you know, it's, it's troubling. You represent that organization now as a manager, supervisor, record keeper, doesn't matter. So you want that information, okay? So if requested by OSHA, would you be able to present your five-year history of logs uh, with our? Many organizations, for reasons I've just specified, they fail to maintain this during that five-year period. That updating and maintenance includes newly discovered recordable injuries and illnesses as well. So going forward, you're also going to want to make sure you're logging and cataloging this stuff. And you don't want to keep, you know, doing or continue doing it the flawed way that created the deficiency to begin with. You need to think about this differently. Also, it includes documenting changes that have occurred in the classification of a previously recorded injury or illness. What if, you know, November there was a recordable and in January or February that claim status, it changed significantly and you may have to go back and adjust something on that 300 log, okay, which could impact your summary, right? So you're going to want to have a system where this happens automatically, okay, that will handle some of that for you instead of having to go to a file cabinet and grab a manual paper log and you're redlining a bunch of stuff and you're rewriting a bunch of stuff. It lends itself to, you know, editing errors, leaving off information that is required, and opens you up to potential compliance problems like citations. Look, bottom line, make sure that those logs are maintained. Make sure they're easily accessible so you can always provide those up-to-date copies to OSHA or other, you know, people that are requesting this information in a legal capacity. And I know that having a digital solution, it's at your fingertips, it's on your phone, you open the app, you get it right away, and you can email it, whether you're on vacation, whether you're uh, out of the office, in a pinch, you want to be able to produce this stuff and, and get access to it. It's right there at your fingertips. Okay, number five, lack of alignment between workers' comp record keeping and OSHA record keeping. Yeah, okay, they're separate records, but the information on workers' comp records and OSHA records should at least coordinate and the information should be able to line up accordingly. This also means that if OSHA were to ask to see your workers' comp records, the information provided should be able to align with your OSHA log and injury reports that you're keeping, you know, in-house, right? Or else you should be ready to explain why it does not. And I've come across this, I, you know, in my years as, as a consultant, this was a trick I used a lot. And, and it was, it always paid off because, and paid off meaning I was always able to find a discrepancy and it was a sort of low-hanging fruit. I know it's a dirty trick, but, you know, we know these are common mistakes. So I would go in and I would say, hey, let me see your accident reports. And they would show me, you know, an accident report a supervisor filled out and submitted. And then I would say, okay, let me see your insurance claim uh, information the employee filled out when they went to, you know, see the doctor or filled out with the uh, insurance carrier, either a state run uh, workers comp system or a private carrier insurance carrier. I would be able to put those side by side. And more often than not, I would find discrepancies in time position. I've even seen it as bad as it's not the right arm, it was the left arm. And I mean, some major problems with those two accounts. So they should line up. Well, with a digital system, and I've been, when I was taking a look at iReport source, 
you know, it will actually produce both records. So you go in, you log the incident and explain what happened, and you can actually copy that to, in, in a lot of these systems, to an insurance report or first report of injury or, or something like that. They're aligned because you've entered the information one time. You don't have to do it twice where the account was different. The other problem I've seen with this is we have a handwritten incident report come in from the field and it goes to an office manager, an insurance uh, manager, or a safety person. And you have to type it into an Excel or spreadsheet or some sort of, um, you know, manual word document or uh, whatever. And you're transcribing. It's human nature to use words and correct the original handwritten note with what you know to be true. And there's another discrepancy. So you avoid all of that with this digital solution or a service, again, like iReport Source. And that's what this is built for. Okay. So uh, look, avoid any OSHA record keeping error. One significant obstacle with detailed, accurate, and organized record keeping, not having consistent or a reliable way for workers to do this. iReport Source changes all of that. It makes it possible to track and manage uh, workflow and accountability in real time. I mean, with everything from reporting employee injuries and even auto accidents, property damage, to performing job safety audits and even inspections, a system like this is your all-in-one safety solution, if you will. Everything is kept nice and tidy in one place, and it's digital. You can access it anywhere at any time. So, te look, technology is Powerful. It can really help us minimize risk of noncompliance, eliminate potential uh, citations, and it streamlines our entire documenting record keeping process. At the end of the day, the bulk of your work shouldn't be collecting all this information, reorganizing it, and re entering it into a manual database that. Quite honestly, even if it's a database or Excel with pivot tables, is going to be somewhat limited in some of the trending it can produce. The bulk of your work is going to be coding, writing, you know, formulas and, and doing creating pivot table. You shouldn't have to mess with any of that stuff. Document the events as they come in and spend the majority of your time on root cause analysis, preventing future ones. And then with the click of a button, or in this case, a thumb, you can have actual trend analysis in real time as, as quickly as, as that, tapping something with a thumb. And that will drive sort of what we're learning and doing a look back of where the events occur, occur what types of injuries are occurring, what pi parts of the body, what areas of the work site. You know, that should drive sort of our response and where we focus our energy. Imagine having to do that and think about that after you've done hours and hours of logging and, and administrative work. It's nuts. I mean, I, it's been years. I still, uh, I still scratch my head when somebody walks up with a, um, you know, a 29 CFR 1910 standards, a book, and throws it on the desk and says, hey, I got this. And I'm like, what are you, nuts? You know, the stuff's online, right? Even with your phone. I mean, it's very rare that you don't have a connection, right? A data connection or internet connection. Look, the vast, the gone are the days, and I remember these days, I grew up in these days where the internet was just not even uh, taking off, right? I was working in this field. And yeah, we lugged those manuals around and it was a pain, okay? And it's so much easier now that the, the vast majority of our work should be engaging people where the work happens and improving processes. We already know we should very quickly be able to tap, 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 sort something, filter something, and then see exactly what's happening and where we should focus our energy. And then it's all about making that pivot, facing the work, engaging with the workforce, and coming up with solutions. Technology can help us do that. So if you're not embracing technology, I'm telling you, you should, okay? If you take anything else away from this episode, um, and by the way, this is not a commercial, it's, it's just You've heard me talk about it. If you're not embracing technology, if you're not leveraging the power of the internet and some of these software solutions 
and what they can provide for us with data, big data, taking all this data actually, and organizing it in a meaningful way for us so that we don't have to do that heavy lifting, which lends itself to mistakes, you know, and compliance issues. If you're not doing that, looking to these solutions, you're missing out. You're missing out on one, you're missing out on being a rock star. You're going to be able to produce results and provide solutions that people hadn't even considered before. You're going to be able to spend and free up a lot of time to spend working with the people that are at the risk, doing the hard work and the heavy lifting and helping them be better, be more awesome at what they do. And that's the goal, right? Is to manage risk or mitigate risk for the company, but empower employees to be better, to, to perform better and, and safer. So looking at technology is great, um, but you know, don't jump on something for technology's sake. It has to make sense. And I'm telling you, when it comes to record keeping, logging training, logging site audits and safety inspections and weekly walkthroughs, all that stuff you have to do, you need to be looking at a digital solution. And the folks at iReport Source, and they blew my socks off. They, they did. They blew me away. I t I've talked to them several times now. I've met with them. I've seen the demos. Look, I'm working hard to partner with them in this podcast because I'm, I'm telling you right now, when you look at you know, the purpose of my podcast and bringing the tools and solutions and helping you manage safety one episode at a time, this right here, they're aligned completely with my mission. Their whole business model is almost reads the same is, you know, helping their subscribers, their users manage safety better. Okay. And, and, and keep people safe. That's what it's all about. So I'll have more information about iReport Source, you know, in subsequent episodes. But, you know, as I was kind of searching for, you know, a, a topic to cover, I, I keep seeing their articles. I, I got on, I stumbled across their website a while back and I subscribed to their blog. And so I get these uh, articles that they write and I'm thinking, man, this is, this is a good one. And I reached out to them and we started up a conversation. We got to know each other uh, rather well. So look, they're great folks. iReportSource.com. Go check them out. It's this, the software is going to blow your mind. Um, I know they have a free trial you can, uh, you can use for a short time to see how it works. But at least for record keeping purposes, OSHA record keeping, for injuries and illnesses. It's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. It's and so simple to use. Anybody in your organization can use it. And that's the key thing for me is you don't need a PhD in computer engineering and safety engineering to figure out how to use it. It is simple that any supervisor, any worker, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, that's, that's that whole user experience, right? Uh, design thinking for the most users is can it be used by anybody in the organization? And the simple answer is, heck yes, absolutely. So look, go check out iReportSource.com. Tell me what you think. Uh, shoot me some emails. What are some of the mistakes that you've come across as a safety professional or that you've noticed just getting into safety at an organization? Uh, you know, what are some of the mistakes you have found, you've come across, maybe you've caught and mitigated that I haven't listed here? There are plenty of them, but uh, I wanted to list the top five. Uh, based on that iReport Source article that they wrote. The link to the article, again, in the show notes, so be sure to check that out. Send me your emails, info at thesafetypropodcast.com. I'd like to hear about your record-keeping horror stories. I love it. Um, I love hearing about this stuff and learning about you know how you guys out there are uh, helping to improve safety in your workplace, and I'd love to share some of that with our other listeners. So keep the emails coming, and until the next Safety Pro Podcast episode, as always, be safe.